government lawyer moves into private practice and a private lawyer moves into government practice and what that means is we're going to see that when we do this analysis it's going to be also a review of what we did uh, with 1.9 when we were talking about a formal representation because what you're doing as a government lawyer may impact uh, what you did as a private uh, attorney and the same thing when a current government lawyer comes from private practice. Something that you're doing for the government may impact something that you did in private practice. So we'll be talking about that. And that will be the last uh, component of uh, conflicts. So we've done current conflicts, former representation conflicts, or so successive conflicts. This past chapter, chapter nine, was those individual conflicts between an attorney and client, primarily with money. We looked at 1.5 a lot, tried to determine what was an unreasonable fee, noted that those are set out in 1.5. Those uh, factors are not exclusive, but it's something that we look at. Uh, then we looked at more specialized relationships under 1.8 noted that a lawyer really should not enter into a transaction with a client, but if he or she does, there are three writings requirement. Three writings require fair terms in writing, seek independent counsel in writing, and then you formalize the entire agreement with informed consent uh, in writing. That's rule, rule 1.8. Uh, so we did an unreasonable fee on page uh, 381. Uh, and there, the, what was driving that case is there's seventy thousand dollars in damages with sixty thousand dollars in fees. So was that unreasonable? We said yes, and we also pointed out other rules that were broken that could have uh, avoided this unreasonable fee. Communication is first and foremost, and notice how communication determines the scope of representation, also competence and diligence. Because if you don't communicate with the client. You may keep doing the same thing over and over again or maybe pursuing the wrong objective. Another thing that the attorney did in this case, an unreasonable free 9-1, was that uh, he didn't really consult with the client about what type of course of action he was going to take. So he went through an entire mediation process with no results, costing a lot of money. So we said that that is not something that an attorney would do. And then from there, there was a, a large part of this chapter talks about improper billing practices. Uh, we noted that contingent fees must be in writing. And that's really interesting when you compare it to a general uh, fee, which is uh, not required to be in writing, uh, and even a fee change preferably in writing. But contingent fees must be in writing because it, this is one of the rare instances where an attorney has a stake in the outcome of the litigation. And so that contingency fee in writing has to talk about the percentage, how that will accrue, what will be remitted to the client, and whether or not uh, expenses will be deducted before or after. And we noted that that is very important if you look on page 400, the client gets uh, more uh, if the fee is calculated after expenses are subtracted. Uh, then we went through Rule 1.5 also to emphasize that you cannot have contingent fees in criminal cases and divorce cases. And then we did uh, Problem 9.2, an impoverished client, noting that we could not uh, extend fees to a client uh, unless they're for trial or litigation expenses. Noted that some jurisdictions take a broader view of expenses. And, and that was pretty much it for that chapter. So, we are going to start chapter 10, Conflict Issues for Government Lawyers and Judges. So, I want to spend the first the portion of this class looking at Rule 1.11 and what it does. Because this, this is going to be important. You watch around. Well, now it's starting to happen. People leaving government, going back to private practice for whatever reason. They're flipping around. And so in an election year, this becomes really uh, important. So you have people leaving government, going back into government, coming back around. And they have baggage with them. And so 
Notice this, this class is fairly new. It comes out of Watergate. There was no professional responsibility class until uh, Watergate. So then you just, as a lawyer, old school lawyer, like in the early part of the 20th century, you just had to know the canons and look at them every now and then, and, and that was that. Uh, so very rare you had this whole regulatory framework spring, uh, springing up. But now we're looking at Rule 1.1. One. These are special conflicts of interest. Notice this, for former, this is what I mean all the time when I say you have to look forward and backwards. So this is one of those real times where you're going to see even within the rule it says 1.7 applies as well as 1.9 when we get to a portion of the rule. So these are special conflicts for former and current. And it says government officers and employees just to make sure you know that it, it applies to everyone across the board. Higher ups, you know, the, the uh, Deputy Associate General, Attorney General for uh, Civil Litigation, all, down, all the way down to a line attorney in the, in the Justice Department. Moving back and forth, that's what we're, we're concerned about. So special conference of interest for former and current government officials. And so we're gonna look at 1.11A, and we're gonna look at 1.11b, and we're going to look at 1.11c. So I'm putting this up on the board because the, the rule is broken down in such a way that it focuses on different things, but it builds upon itself. And then 1.11 So this first scenario, 1.11A, is when that former government lawyer former government employee moves to private practice. Former government employee moves to private practice. That's just paraphrasing the rule. So what we're, what we're focusing on here is the conflict. Just paraphrasing the rule. So if you look at 441 in your book, it sort of breaks it down. This is a less demanding standard. So former government lawyer moves to practice, private practice, and it says, except as law may otherwise expressly permit a lawyer who has formerly served as a public officer of the government is subject is subject to 1.9c. What's that? So it's a lot of cross referencing in this rule. So I'm just sort of emphasizing a level of care. So this is a former government lawyer who moves to private practice, except as law may otherwise expressly permit, a lawyer who has formerly served as a public officer or employee of the government is subject to 1.9C. So my first question to you is what is 1.9C? See, lawyers have a tendency just to read, oh, subject to 1.9C, okay, but I'm still looking at it. 
you have to, the, the thing is telling you is you have to look back and forth. We're looking at 1.9c. And then this is expressly telling us that we are going to spend some time looking at former representation like we did in chapter 8. So what does 1.9c tell us? You know, we know it's a uh, former representation because that's what 1.9 is. It's more, go ahead. It says that when you probably represent someone, that you have to use them um, to not use information um, inappropriately or Okay. So now they'll use this information to the disadvantage of the former client. take something that we did in government and then use that against our former employer, the client, the government. So notice this is the first indication that you get that we are always going to be looking at former representation in this as well. So that's 1.9c and and what? Then you said unless the appropriate government agency gives informed consent, confirmed and right. So you're doing something privately, you get permission from the government because of this conflict, they say it's okay, we can move on. But they're, you know, they may not say okay, but but how do we know about this uh, shall not? Shall not otherwise represent a client in connection with a matter in which the lawyer participated personally and substantially. This is that government work as a public officer unless the appropriate government agency gives informed consent. And so if you look on page 442, you have a great summary of this long-winded rule. They've sort of taken it and broken it down. And it says this. If the look, but this is what we're going to break down. We have to figure out what a matter is, what is participated personally and substantially. What does that mean? But on page 442, you get a good summary. If the lawyer participated personally and substantially in work on a matter while working for the government, the lawyer may not represent a client private client in connection with that matter unless the government gives informed consent. That's right on page 442, top of page 442. But, and that's good, so we get the former lawyer going to private practice that government lawyer may learn something or whatever. I'm not talking about a specialized type of information. We're going to talk about that later when we talk about 1.11c. But the lawyer may have gained something in experience uh, with the government that now can be used 
and private practice against the law government. We have to figure out the matter and personally uh, participate. How do we figure that out? What, what do we do there? What is a matter? It's in the rule and it's referenced in comment two. And you see uh, uh, 1.11 E, I'll just put it there. That's good. What is participated personally or substantially? How do we know that? Tell us on page 444. Tells us there is no definition, but there must be some way for us to figure out uh, what is personally and substantially. So notice if the government lawyer moves to private practice and has just had sort of a tangential relationship to this previous matter that he worked on with, for the government, you know, maybe read a, a one-page memo and then uh, consulted with a partner about what he thought about the memo, interpreting that. That probably wouldn't be personally uh, and substantially enough so to preclude representation without the consent of the government agency. So we wouldn't even, even need to go down the road of conflict there because it wouldn't be enough. But how do we figure out it if it's enough? That's the problem. So, you see from the book that in terms of drafting this rule, I think the ABA sort of just lifted some language from a, a federal statute, plugged it in there, and we don't have a definitional section. So we want to figure out what is personally and substantial. What do you think that means? What do you think? Ms. Horn, tell. What do you think? I really don't know. I'm not sure. Take a guess. Um, Push it a little bit. Personally <laughs> and substantially. Probably, I mean, well, yes, but I uh, may mean that I. Um, like so, my little hypo where I just looked at a memo, I'm in government practice. I know I'm going to uh, Frost Brown Todd in two weeks, and this is my last assignment. I just like look at it. Yeah, that's good. That's what I thought about it, that's that, and then I leave, I go to private practice, uh, and then the partner's asking me, well, what did you work on? Yeah, I worked on this little thing. And it is definitely a matter that is, that is related to what I worked on in, in the government. Then we say, okay, we have to really check uh, about, first, the type of information. We can't use the information to the disadvantage of our former client, 
uh, but also my involvement in it. And so maybe the, the information is uh, important, but, but have I had enough involvement in it to preclude me from actually working on it? What do you think? I think it depends on how much the lawyer is involved in the case. Yes. Um, so like the former client privilege, like attorney-client privilege with the, um, when the attorney was working in the government mm -hmm. um, versus like if they had, like if they know all this stuff about that um, situation versus working on it like on the opposing side, that's unfair. Well, yeah. Well, how do we measure what I've done? So, I guess the question is, it's sort of a matter, I, I said in my hypo that it, it's related to what I did, it's a proceeding or something. Now I, quote, switch sides. I may have information that disadvantages the former client, but the question is, in order to make that determination, you see, and I have to be personally and, and substantially involved. So what, what does it say about that involvement? Um, so personal and substantial participation is exercised through decision, approval, disapproval, recommendation, the rendering of advice, investigation, or otherwise. Okay. Into that case. Um, and so if you're, if it's personally, you're directly, uh, you're directly participating. Okay, directly. In it. In the middle of it. Okay. But what about substantial? So your whatever you're doing would have to have significance. Okay. So what about my high book? I would say that's not mm -hmm. it it's personal but it's not substantial. Mm -hmm. Um because I mean a memo is just like Yeah, and I'm heading out the door. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I, yeah, I did the research. And I'm thinking about my, my next step. I've done everything competently and everything, but I have direct involvement, but it is not of significance. You see on page, uh, uh, and that's the difficulty about this rule. We don't have a direct uh, definition, but you see on page 444, we want that direct involvement that is of significance to whatever we are making in terms of decision making. And then that information uh, will be a disadvantage to the client. That's why it says and. So we want the type of information and the involvement and make a determination about whether or not this individual attorney is disqualified. So notice how this rule is set up. 1.11a deals with that, the conflict itself of this individual attorney. And then that attorney can participate if she was not particip uh, participating directly and substantially, doesn't have access to information that would disadvantage the former government client. If she does, then we ask the government a form informed consent. appropriate government agents. So that's not automatic. The government may say no. And so 1.11b really deals with that. It says, okay, this one lawyer has this conflict and we know that this conflict moves through the firm. 1.11b deals with imputation. So even though this conflict runs through the firm, there may be something that we can do about it. Imputation for government lawyers. Look at the top of page 445. So that's just a little rule chart that we have in the book all the time. Uh, but this rule tells us something a little bit different. What does this rule do? So 
So you know the first prong of this rule states the imputation rule. And we saw this in rule 1.10. And you recall that the requirement of 1.10 uh, was a lot more stringent here. A lot more stringent than what we have here. And if you look at comment four to this entire body of rules, we, we see that we want to encourage movement back and forth. There's no reason why uh, the government should not have access to the best attorney. Pays less, but that's fine. That's when you hear uh, people in public office say, I'm going back to make some money. That's what they're talking about. I'm leaving this position and I'm going to this other, other firm. And so the back and forth, we don't want it to be so rigid that uh, conflicts serve as barriers to people uh, pursuing public interest work and on the flip side, private practice just because of the conflict. And so comment four really talks about that. But but how does 1.11b one, one, one one, one work? How does it work? So notice, when a lawyer is disqualified from representation under paragraph A, that's what we just did, no lawyer in a firm with which that lawyer is associated may knowingly undertake or continue representation in such a matter and list. I'll just put, for conflict purposes, The firm is one lawyer. The firm cannot represent unless, unless what? And that's what? Yeah, that's right. Um, they screen the disqualified lawyer and then also give notice to the government, the appropriate government agency. Okay, so notice, that we're, we're encouraging uh, screening. And it's a lot less uh, stringent than what we had in uh, 110, 1.10. T talk a little bit about the difference between those two, just sort of as a review. Oh, between uh, one and two? You mean? Uh, between uh, 1.10 imputation and now what we're doing under 1.11. Oh. Just how more stringent it is. So the imputation gives us uh, the option of screening, but what we're talking about now is more specialized because we have that former government lawyer. Here we just have lawyers moving between firms and it seems a lot more stringent. I'm referring specifically to 1.102. So the prohibition is based on 1.9a or b, so some type of form of conflict, and arises out of the disqualified lawyer's association with a prior firm, and, so what do you notice that's kind of different about 110? Well, I mean, they have to, they mm -hmm. have to give the former uh, they have to contact the former client and mm -hmm. give a lot more information about mm -hmm. how how the screening was done mm -hmm. and uh, the procedures that were in place and uh -huh. uh, review may be available before a tribunal so yeah. it's a lot more involved. certificates of compliance yeah. mm -hmm. 
And so this is a, the lawyer just moving to another farm and there might be impact uh, because of the former representation in 110. Uh, and so we're, we're saying we're really concerned about under 1.9a about this materially adverse information uh, and we're also concerned with the type of information that the lawyer uh, actually acquired. So not only he, what the lawyer would have acquired in this, uh, in this representation, but actually required. And remember 1.9A and B made distinctions uh, between uh, those two things. But we're still concerned with uh, the lawyer moving over and having this information. It's less stringent here because we want to ensure that people can move from government to private practice. So we don't have the written notice. We don't have certificates of compliance. Uh, and you know, the written notice is fairly uh, detailed if you look at, at 110. So, not less stringent. So here we just need written notice. So you have a different standard when we just talk about simple imputation. Here, notice this, the rule even tells you these are special conflicts of interest, so we want to encourage movement by regulating it in some way, but not as stringent as we did under 110. So if you look at the rule that we're working on now, 1.11, you have this disqualified lawyer we still want to work on the case. The government isn't going to give us any consent. This disqualified lawyer under paragraph A means that no lawyer in our firm can undertake this unless we timely screen from any participation in the matter and no money from the matter. No fee is apportioned. And written notice is given properly to the uh, appropriate government agency. And so the, we don't have that elaborate framework like we did on some, under simple imputation because the government can take care of itself and the government will make a determination about whether or not a compliance is enough in this case. So the first part of the rule sets up the conflict of the individual and attorney. The second part says this conflict can move through the, through the firm, but if it does, we can screen. <coughs> And then 1.11c deals with this special type of information that a government attorney comes into contact with. Confidential government information. that and why is that so important? Confidential government information. You see uh, your little chart on uh, 1.11c on page 446. But look at your rule book too. That sort of, that breaks it down too. Confidential government information.
So we've gone from conflict, how the conflict runs through the form, to now what type of information you may have had from your prior employment with the government, and whether that can be used in this private matter. So what's the big deal about confidential government information? Um, if you, it's information that you get under government authority. You usually have to have some kind of clearance, and then you have the privilege not to disclose certain things. Yeah. And notice this information comes from your special powers as a government official. This isn't circulating publicly. This is non-public information, and it's derived solely from your position. So this is a special type of information. And so we say in 1.11c, a lawyer having information that the lawyer knows is confidential governmental information about a person acquired when the lawyer was a public officer or employee may not represent a pri private client whose interests are adverse to that person in a matter in which the information could be used to the material disadvantage of that person. So you're in private practice, you have this government information and you use it against someone uh, because of who you're representing currently in, in the private matter. You have this government information and you, uh, you unleash it. And so this government information is defined in the rule as information obtained under governmental authority. So this is a special type of information. And so, and it isn't public. The government is either prohibited from disclosing it publicly or there's some type of legal privilege not to disclose. On any level, it is not available to the public. And so, notice there's screening provided here too. So the first part of this rule says, cannot, I'm just paraphrasing, use information So that, that person is someone whose interests are adverse to the client that you're representing in this current matter. You have governmental information and you're trying to use. I'm just paraphrasing the rule. The rule is just make sure you look at, at the rule. So you cannot use this information to the material advantage of that person. So again, you come from government practice, you have this type of confidential governmental information. Uh, a clear signal is that it derives from your past opportunities, duties, and obligations as a government lawyer. You come into private practice, you cannot use that information to the disadvantage of that person whose interests are adverse to the current private client. So if someone you're representing, you can't use uh, the confidential governmental information that you've obtained against someone on the other side of the V or the other side of the transaction. That's just a paraphrase of the rule. So, if you have this information, it cannot be used, but notice, what about screening? How do you, is that in the rule too? What about that? This lawyer is disqualified. So a screening permitted even if, if you have a disqualified lawyer? Yeah, disqualified, tell, tell me how it works. Um, yeah, so they, if, uh, if they're part of a firm that's gonna represent that client, then as long as the uh, disqualified lawyer is screened for fee participation in the matter and is apportioned no part of the fee, uh -huh. then, yeah. 
Good. Yeah, most of the rule down. We have the conflict, we have the imputation, we have the type of information that we don't want used, but we still have screening. And now we have to do 1.11D. Now what is the difference? You don't have to ask permission uh, here if it's imputed and we have this uh, former government lawyer who has this conflict. If you look on page 445, the firm does not have to seek consent from the government agency as a prerequisite to taking on the conflicted work. That's under 1.1b. That's why we went right into uh, Green. And you'll see in your text that this confidential information, government information, the government can't give you consent to use that. So that's something that can't be consented to. So that's why we go again to screening there as well. We disqualify in a timely manner the, the lawyer, screen the disqualified lawyer, and make sure there's no participation, no fee. Yes? Um, I've got one thing to see. What about, um, what if that confidential information somehow? A little bit loud, I can't hear you. What if the confidential information gets leaked by someone other than the employee, like say a whistleblower like reveals that confidential information to the public? What, is it still considered confidential for conflict purposes or? Well, I don't know. I think uh, there be, I think there's something built into whistleblower statutes uh, that give you a privilege to do that duty. So we don't, you, you always want somebody to break the privilege if the government is doing something wrong. And so you, you see the current argument we're having back and forth about, you know, it being hearsay, can you report this as the obligation? That's why everyone is talking about a whistleblower being exempt. So uh, this may be confidential information, governmental information, but it isn't being used to the disadvantage of some client on the other end. It's used for another public purpose of making sure uh, that there isn't corruption. So. I think that that would be an exception. Yeah. Good. Uh, so, and also, that, that's, a, that's a good you asked that. So, also, in response to Ms. Harper's question, you also have to make sure uh, what type of information it is. We, we already talked about that, but we have to make sure. We're talking about actual knowledge. That's why I have comment eight up there. So if we're talking about confidential governmental information, we mean a scenario where the lawyer has actual knowledge. Doesn't really work with information that merely may be imputed to the former government lawyer. Actual knowledge. So we want this lawyer to have something that is kind of explosive based upon their prior uh, duties as a government lawyer that can be used to the material disadvantage of a private person in this, this matter that the 
a former government lawyer is representing a client in? So we have former government lawyer moves to private practice. What if about 1.11D, what scenario? That this is a different scenario. So look at page 448. We're, we're talking about a different scenario. So how is this different than the situation we were talking about in 1.11A? government lawyer. I'll put that, that up here. So, current So this is someone who's come from private practice and now is a government, government lawyer. Government lawyer from private. Right. So the former labor secretary, remember Acosta? He was a private lawyer. Uh, and the dean of a law school, but he moved from that to being a government lawyer. So then you have to analyze what he did in private practice that could impact his practice as a current government lawyer. So notice this, forward and backward again. A lawyer. Currently serving as a public officer or employee is subject to 1.7 and 1.9. Subject to current conflicts. And 1.9 form. And then you have the, the, the same language that you had over here. Shall not participate. Here, this next problem that we're about to do measures this. Participated personally and substantially.
Now there is an exception. So like if you were a law clerk or something like that, judicial law clerk, and you're negotiating for private employment, this isn't gonna affect you. It even says it in the rules. So that's not a word. We're, we're more concerned with this government lawyer from private practice uh, and, and what have you. So subject to 1.7 and 1.9 and shall not participate in the matter in which the lawyer participated personally and substantially while in private practice, unless the appropriate government agency gives informed consent, conformed in writing. So that sort of lines up nicely, I guess, with this problem on page 449, current government lawyer. District Attorney, problem 10-1 on page 449. District Attorney. So we're looking at 1.1D or sections under there. We have to figure out how this works. And so what's gonna be interesting about this is when this government lawyer was a private attorney, he was involved in a civil matter, and now he's a prosecutor, prosecuting this case, criminal matter. Civil matter was an accident. Government matter is a criminal case. That's the current case. So what's going to drive our analysis on some level is, is there a substantial relationship between the accident and the murder case? And the facts are sort of set up in such a way as uh, you get always a, sort of a, a, a large lapse of time. We have 12 years past here, 12 years ago as a private attorney, this district attorney negotiated a settlement for Zeke Brick, Brick in an auto accident where he suffered a concussion. So you see on page 449, last month, he's now 17, he was arrested, charged with murder, his lawyer is a public defender, served notice that, this is going to be important, that the defense is going to be mental disease or defect. In this letter, the public defender goes on, and we're all the, we're all the prosecutors, tells us that we should disqualify ourselves because 12 years ago, we represented Brick in a civil matter, the automobile accident case. This is on top of page 450. Your old firm has already turned over Brick's case to the public defender, and we haven't asked to re re or received a copy. And then it just says, under Rule 1.11, <coughs> should you withdraw from representing the state in the prosecution of Brick, or may we proceed? Can we proceed with this representation? So we're over here. We have a DA serving as a public officer, so we're gonna have to look at 1.7, 1.9 in particular, and we cannot participate in the matter in which we participated personally and substantially. But that's seen through the lens of, is there a substantial relationship? And you could start off by saying, well, are these things really substantially related?
Yeah, how do we know? How do we make the determination? <coughs> That's what we're talking about under 1.9. So, you could say car accident, murder, no substantial relationship, that's that. But I think we did something a little bit more critical and nuanced under uh, 1.9. What type of questions did we ask to see if it was substantially related or not? I'm sorry? Significance? Well, you gotta look at 1.9. What do we do with 1.9? Significance is over there. And this one plugs you into 1.9 and says, look at that. Are there materially adverse interests? Yeah. What type of information, what, what do we do when we sort of started talking about, even apart from the effect, on the former client. We sort of did some evaluation about the quality of this information. Ms. Matthew, go ahead. I think it was comment three to 1.9. It says that substantially related is basically when representation of the former matter could have given you confidential information that can be used adversely in the subsequent matter. That's right. And so notice, that's that presumption we talked about. We're not even talking about actual knowledge. We're talking about if you were an attorney Litigating in this particular context, is this the type of information that you would have normally come into contact with? And if so, then we take the next step uh, that uh, Ms. Harper was talking about. Is it materially adverse to the interest of the client? But look at comment three. It's a presumption. The former client, Brick, doesn't even have to uh, reveal any confidence or anything because what we're looking at it's confidential information that a lawyer normally would obtain in this type of representation. So matters are substantively, substantially related for purposes of the rule if they involve the same transaction or legal dispute, that's the easy one, or if there are otherwise there's a substantial risk that confidential factual information as would normally have been obtained in the prior representation would materially advance the client's position in the subsequent matter. So notice how we tie together what Mr. Mattingly said and what Mr. Uh, Mr. Mattingly said and what Ms. Harper said. You, you connect them both. One is what type of information would you have received and then what impact would that have on the client? So what do we say about this type of analysis here? What happens here? You know, just for, in terms of prosecuting, that's going against a, a former client. No, there's no definition of a materially adverse, but there are some cases that say that a former client should have confidence that the former attorney won't undo or come after or show disloyalty uh, to the former client, even though that relationship has ended. So I guess the question after we look at comment three is this. Can you use information from the former representation, the civil auto case, to advance the prosecution in the current case? Potentially, yes. <clears throat> okay, how? What do, you think, what are you thinking about? Uh, I'm thinking about the defense. So, and so when you say yes, you're saying the two matters are substantially related, Mr. Mattingly's point, and then your point, and there is material at first. That's what you're saying. Potentially, because I'm thinking about what the public defender is planning on using as his defense. Okay. Um, mental disease or defect. Would, if that were the case, wouldn't you have known something about it when you first met with Rick? Yeah, and not even actual knowledge, though. We're saying if you came into contact with Brick, as you're suggesting, 
you would have been exposed to medical information of some kind. And so we don't even have to prove actual. And so on some level you're saying the two matters are substantially related and there's material adversity. In other words, uh, there is a substantial risk that a lawyer representing a child injured in this case would have learned facts that would materially advance the current prosecution. So all of the sensitive medical information, you could sort of just think hypothetically uh, what the now prosecutor would have come into contact in the former civil representation. You know, brain damage, mental illness, any history of child abuse and trauma, family history of mental illness, criminal behavior, all of those things. There's more. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that should have been pointed out in the hypo. I think the uh, prosecutor has, I'll just add some facts to the, pro, to the hypo. I think the prosecutor has told uh, the, his supervisor, whoever is in the office, internally about this 12 years ago, or when it comes to our attention, we, we disclose it. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and then uh, the prosecution to make this hypo go forward probably said, okay, we know about this, but we, 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 we're fine with it, let's go forward. And then the public defender finds out and says, no, this isn't okay, uh, this is a conflict. So I want to emphasize this, the test it's not what the lawyer actually knew, but rather whether a lawyer reasonably could have learned confidential information that could be used adversely to the former client, Rick, in the subsequent prosecution. So I think what we're pointing at is that there is a wealth of information that could be used to discredit Rick's defense, and that's a problem. That's a problem. So what do you think happened in the real case, though? This, uh, I think this was from Connecticut, but real case, as most of these cases are, what do you think happened? Do you think the prosecutor was disqualified? I hope. You hope? Why? I just think it'd be fair. Um, I'm sorry? I think it'd be more fair. Um, more fair, but why? It's, it has to be more than fairness. It's plug into the rule. Why, why do you think he was disqualified? Because I think it uh, there's a substantial relationship with this, and like you said, he would have potential to have information that could undermine the defense. Okay, and so uh, that's exactly what happened. The prosecutor was disqualified, and that's fine. They just got another lawyer within the prosecutor's office uh, and went to trial and the defendant was convicted of murder. But then he appeals and he says that the entire prosecutor's office uh, should have been disqualified because of this conflict and the court rejected that argument and upheld the conviction. That's interesting, good. So that's that first uh, problem, 10-1. And now uh, most uh, PR books are sort of uh, just cover judicial ethics in sort of a basic way, not a major chapter on it, but sort of tries to draw upon uh, conflicts, the special conflicts rules, and then apply them to another type of government official, judges. So if you look uh, on page 450, you have the canons, but I want to point out that under these canons, there are rules as well. So under these canons, there are rules as well. But the, so the Code of Judicial Conduct is set up with a series of canons, but there are rules un under them as, as well. And so if you look in your book, Yeah, start on page 475 or so in your rule book, if that's, or towards the end, it's in, in the appendix. It says ju judicial conduct material. Uh, you have the different rules under the canon. 
Now in the book, it's just, in our text, it's just listed as conflicts involving judges, arbiters, and that type of thing. And so we have the first four canons, which are important. Uh, canon one is that a judge has to be independent and impartial. So it's not even enough just to say, well, there are no conflicts. You want to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. So this notion of independence and impartiality uh, should be, there should be no question about in, impartiality. Competence and diligence, that sort of carries over from what an attorney does. Canon three says minimize conflict. So a judge has to make sure that he or she is not a, in a position where conflicts could arise. So maybe the judge used to be a, a public defender and, and policy maker uh, for the federal public defenders in DC and then moves over uh, to be a judge. Uh, and then wants to continue that affiliation with the uh, public defenders uh, research arm. Probably couldn't do that. Uh, you know, the appearance of impropriety, notion that uh, decisions would be predetermined, particular ideological bent. So that's why during uh, confirmation hearings or, or, or even judicial races, attorneys who want to become judges or uh, candidates for judicial nominees, they have to make sure that there is no appearance of impropriety, no connection with something that could uh, cause one to question uh, their impartiality and also avoid situations that could lead to conflict. And then finally, no political activity. Now, one thing that has come up, and this has been sort of a major argument in the last 20 years or so, is that all judges are subject to the code of judicial conduct except the Supreme Court. And so there's been some argument about whether or not should the rules of professional responsibility, namely a code of judicial conduct, applied to Supreme Court justices. Some of the arguments is that, well, this is the final uh, forum for resolution of disputes and we don't need to be uh, policed by any outside entity. It undermines the finality of the, uh, the institution. The argument on the other side is the judge is a judge no matter how high and should be subject to uh, the same uh, principles. And so you have that discussion on page uh, 451 and still goes on. Uh, uh, note particularly footnote 39 on page 452 that, that discussed. <coughs> and there would be some uneasiness about the structure of how discipline will work. So do we get all federal judges from different circuits and they sit on a panel judging their peers what happens to the final decision? Is that reviewable outside of the judiciary? What would be final? Who would, so those are all the arguments. But then on the other side, people say we do it for uh, federal judges. We have impeachment power or, or state judges. We have uh, the Kentucky uh, Bar Association Office of Discipline. Same thing throughout all other states. So why shouldn't we be able to do the same thing? Uh, then this other case, on page uh, 454 is a really devastating case that happened in Pennsylvania. You have these two judges who are pictured on page 455. Uh, they basically commodified justice and ran a sort of a juvenile uh, prison meal where they would just sentence people so that we could populate prisons and they would get kickbacks for that as well as uh, uh, paving the way for construction of uh, private prisons. And they received over $2.6 million in kickbacks to warehouse juveniles. So in other words, we need people to fill up these new prisons that we're building, and so this became sort of an assembly line, not of justice, but making sure that there, these uh, prisons were, were filled. Uh, the judges uh, uh, issued about 4,000 juvenile convictions those were dismissed, and the judges uh, 
Steve Varela re received uh, 28 years and Conahan 17 years. They're both pictured on page 455. So that's bad. Bad. Now on page 456 you have sort of a list of uh, judges requirements and it, in order not to be biased or prejudiced you see all of the examples of conducts that could manifest bias or prejudice and what a judge must avoid. So you may recall uh, Judge uh, Sotomayor when she was uh, doing her confirmation hearings uh, she resigned from one of her uh, organizations uh, because there was some question about uh, her impartiality if she belonged to this private group. And you see on page 457, affiliation with discriminatory organizations undermines the impartiality that a judge has. And so uh, she resigned. Then there is a, another case that's listed from our own Sixth Circuit, a judge uh, refused to resign uh, from an all-white men's club. And so there is some discussion about whether or not this is uh, just a personal interest of, of mine. Some judges have argued that in order to avoid uh, not resigning from those organizations. Uh, but public interest organizations have challenged that in terms of their impartiality because the argument goes, if you belong to this group, how can you be uh, impartial? Ex parte communications are generally prohibited, but you see on page 458, uh, there could be an emergency where the judge needs to talk to someone alone. You could have a disinterested expert, so that's not a party, that's fine. A judge can consult uh, her staff. Uh, a judge can meet separately uh, if the parties consent to it, or there might be some other situation, other law that might allow it. And so throughout these materials, you see the question is, can the judge's impartiality be questioned? For example, look on page uh, 460. This footnote, this is a hypothetical that. Now, That third bullet point, it says, a judge during the last election campaign to retain his seat said, if elected, I will impose the death penalty on any defendant convicted of first degree murder. You know, in the, in the heat of a campaign, you make a promise that uh, it's gonna get the, the electorate uh, energized, tough on crime. So in every case that we have first degree murder, I will uh, impose the death penalty. The judge is elected and the defendant is convicted of first degree murder in his courtroom. May the judge hear that matter or must the judge recuse himself? And so how do you do that? So you have these canons but you also have, under the canons, rules. And one such rule deals with this qualification. This is in the back of the book. 2.11 deals with uh, this qualification. So should this judge be disqualified? And so this comes out of the major canon, a judge shall perform the duties of judicial office impartially, competently, and dil diligently. That's canon two. And then this rule under canon two de deals with this qualification.
should that just dis disqualify? I just gave you the whole rule, but there is a provision under this canon that suggests that maybe this judge should move on. Look at uh, 2.115. The footnote tells you that too, it's cited in the footnote, but. The judge, while a judge or a judicial candidate has made a public statement other than in a public court proceeding, judicial decision or opinion, that commits or appears to commit the judge to reach a particular result or rule in a particular way in a proceeding of controversy. And notice how that would undermine impartiality. I mean, you're not judging anything because you already know the result because you've made a promise that you would impose that penalty. So that's not impartial or neutral. You've already made up your decision. So that shows that you're taking a particular position that will impact thousands of cases. So this qualification probably should be warranted there. Let's do this last uh, problem in uh, chapter 10, the judge's professor. This happened uh, really in Arkansas. And so this, this problem tries to get at ex parte communications, previous relationships, anything that could call into question the judge's impartiality, impartiality diligence, uh, and competence. So we are a lawyer for this client. The suit is filed in federal court, and we are assigned to a federal judge, Mindy Lynch. Uh, we represent our client. The client used to be a law professor, uh, and now uh, we're in front of this judge who used to be a student. And there was some controversy years ago about a mislaid exam book. Uh, and this judge uh, took our client's class and he doesn't know what happened, but he mislaid the stack of exam books. There was uh, some turmoil in the law school. Uh, he lost the grades and, and offered to give everyone in the class a B-plus grade, uh, but she said, no, I feel I deserve a higher grade. After some negotiation, he gives the then student an A. Uh, so that's one. Then there's another uh, funny coincidence as well. The judge's husband is now a law professor at the same law school where our client used to work. They know each other just, just a little bit. Uh, and uh, even weirder it says, the lawyers went to meet with the judge for a status conference a couple of weeks ago. And the husband is in the pretrial conference. Uh, participating in the discussion of the issues in the case. Uh, and there are rumors that the judge's husband helps her from time to time evaluate and decide cases uh, before her, so that's bad. So the, qu the uh, question goes through a couple things. First is, what impact does this prior relationship between Lynch uh, and our client, the judge and our client, have on this case? So should we sort of disclose this and deal with it? Assuming that the ABA Code of Judicial Conduct applies, uh, is a motion requesting recusal uh, is filed, will the judge have to disqualify herself? herself? We looked at 2.11. Then finally, uh, the Code of Judicial Conduct prohibits a judge from allowing family, political, financial, or other interests 
to influence the judge's independence or conduct. Now, 2.9 allows the judge to receive uh, information and consultation from a disinterested expert, but can we look at her husband that way? And then the question is, has the judge violated the standard of judicial ethics? What do you think? So when we come back, I want you to look at Rule 2.4, 2.9 of the Judicial Code. Did the judge violate these rules? And then we're going to look generally at 2.11, should she disqualify herself? And that will finish uh, Chapter 10, and we'll start Chapter 11 when we come back on Tuesday. Have a good week.